Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Southern Look. I'm Marina. And I'm Kaylin. And guess what you guys, we hit 4,000 downloads. We're only a thousand away from 5,000. I almost forgot math, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we want to do something fun for you guys for 5,000, but like, I don't know what to do. So, give us some ideas, please. Reach out to us on the socials. Yup. Alright Marina, what are you teaching us today? So today, did you know that Chicago was raised by over a foot during the 1850s and 60s without disrupting daily life? Like raised the whole foot. Some spots Like the city city of Chicago like lifted off the ground a foot. Yeah, in some places 10 feet. Because the city of Chicago had a problem with mud because they were so close to a lake and the roads and sidewalks would be submerged in mud and it would spread illnesses like typhoid fever and a deadly outbreak of cholera? I think that's how you say it? Like some bacterial disease. Um, so yeah, their plan was to hire an engineer who recommended storm sewers but said this would require increasing the level of the city. So they increased the level of the city by up to a foot to 10 feet. That is crazy. How does one do that? And what I want to know is why hasn't New Orleans done that? <laughs> Seriously, we need to move New Orleans up way more than 10 feet. Yeah, but like, how the heck? It took over two decades to complete, and but it like still didn't really disrupt daily life there. I don't know how. Because like when they do simple construction on our roads, it's like <laughs> traffic out the ass. They must have taken a tiny segment every, but that would take for, I have no idea how they did that. So 20 freaking years. But yeah, I was like kind of mind blown by that. They literally took a city like Chicago and just bloop, lifted it. What year did you say that happened in? Between the 1860s, no, 50s and 60s. So I guess like life wasn't as busy and hectic back then as it is yeah, now. Yeah, so it wasn't so populated yeah. either. They were still like going westward. But yeah, that's my little fun fact. Hope you enjoy. And, y'all, for today's episode, we are going to be traveling far back in time and far, far away to ancient Egypt. One of my favorite topics in the whole wide world. Dude, I don't know about y'all, but I am obsessed with Egypt. I know Marina is obsessed with Egypt as well. There is just so, so, so much you can talk about. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, when I was, like, in middle school and we first learned about Egypt, I loved the information so much, and I never wanted to forget it, that I wrote... The whole chapter down in my binder. So, that's how much I love it. And then she threw it away. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> realistically, five years later when I found it in my closet, I was like, when am I going to use this? Today. Today, Marina. That's what current research is for. There's been a lot more discoveries since then. <laughs> so, we are actually going to make this a two-parter episode because there is just so much you can talk about. From mythology to the history to the ancient pharaohs to theories and conspiracies about the pyramids. There's just so much we can talk about. So we're going to try to break it down little by little so that everybody can keep up. Because it's sometimes hard for me to even keep up when I'm researching this just because the theories can get really, really crazy. Yeah, and they range from like so many different subjects. (sighs) I don't know how we're going to outline this, but just stay with us because it's going to be interesting. All right, Marina, you want to get us started off? Yeah, so... A little introduction in case you're not very familiar with Egypt, but for almost 30 centuries, ancient Egypt was the leading civilization in the Mediterranean world, and from the great pyramids of the Old Kingdom through the military conquest of the New Kingdom, Egypt has long intrigued archaeologists and historians and scientists and created a field all of its own called Egyptology, which, like, I would love to be an Egyptologist. The microbiologist and Egyptologist, that's me. But the main sources of information about ancient Egypt are the many monuments and objects and artifacts that have been recovered from these ancient sites and from hieroglyphs that have only recently been deciphered. Um, should we get to touch on history at all? Yeah, let's get started with some history of Egypt. Okay, so. In the late Stone Age, the communities in Northeast Africa would do like any other country did and exchange hunting for agriculture and made early advances that 
pave the way for later development like arts and crafts, technology, politics, religion, like Egypt somehow knew how to do everything. Um, and they also had the Nile River, which basically, I feel like if they didn't have the Nile River, maybe they wouldn't be so advanced, but like they, they finessed that river and made it part of their everyday life. Um, <laughs> finessed that river. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this guy, Snefru? We're going to be mispronouncing names this entire time, though. Just give us a little bit of a break. Yeah, because, like, could y'all say it right <laughs> without going to Google Translate and, like, listening to the girl say it? I don't think so. But Snefru built, like, the first kind of pyramid that Egypt's had, or at least that we know of, called the Red and the Bent Pyramids. Those are two different ones, not the Red and Bent one. But the Bent one was, like, super wonky but like still look like a pyramid but then we get to the fourth dynasty which Egypt was ruled in like or ancient Egypt had about 20 to 25 dynasties of pharaohs and stuff and pharaohs are their kings if you didn't know um but once we get into the fourth dynasty King Khufu Khufu yeah, he decided he wanted this really elegant tomb, and that is where we get the Pyramid of Giza. And then they built two more for his successors, and that's where we get the Great Pyramids. And then there's the Great Sphinx, with facial, facial features of a man, but the body of a resting lion. And in typical history, they think that the Sphinx was built after the Pyramids, but I've seen a lot of things recently saying that it is older than them, like way older. So we'll get into that later. And also, a lot of the research that I did disputes the fact that these people built these pyramids and that they were tombs to begin with. But we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Alright. So then, all of that was the Old Kingdom. Because it's kind of classified as like the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. Um, then we get to... Can you imagine being Snefru, was that his name, and building an entire ass pyramid, and then they name it the Bent Pyramid? I'd be so pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> but he tried, he tried. They learned from his mistakes. Um, but some, okay, let's get into the Middle Kingdom. And during the Middle Kingdom, Egypt once again flourished. They had like a lot of ups and downs, depending on like who their king was. But they always like rose up again somehow. Um, in the 12th dynasty, the kings ensured the smooth succession of their line by making each other drink though. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope y'all can see that on the camera. <laughs> yeah, if not, we'll just cut it out. But anyways, um, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt pursued an aggressive foreign policy and they colonized Nubia, which honestly, if you ask me where that was on a map, I would guess it's in Africa, right? Or like South Asia? I don't know. I'm bad at geometry, okay? Geometry? <laughs> Geography! <laughs> it's been a long day, okay? I've had three classes, okay? <laughs> Leave me alone. Okay, Cameron, take over. <laughs> Alright, so I really want to talk about these pyramids. I feel like that's yeah. like the most of the research that I've done. Enough history. That's boring. Yeah, let's talk about some fun facts about these pyramids before we get into how what I think the pyramids are for. Okay. Alright, so Marina has prepared an entire list of pyramid fun facts for us. So they were referenced in hieroglyphs, which first of all hieroglyphs are the coolest thing in the world. We're going to touch on that in a little bit. As a staircase to heaven. They were built with amazing accuracy with an error rate of 0.03%. So if you're looking at an error rate, it's 0.03% or 0.0003 was the error rate. Yeah, and just to put that in perspective, I take a lot of chemistry classes and labs, and when we're like measuring things to the millimeter, and then we have to like calculate our error rate, like standard deviation or whatever it's yeah. called, I don't even get that close like like, my error rates are so much higher than that, and that's measuring things to the millimeter. So, like, they were spot on. And with the pyramids, y'all, y'all have to remember that they were built 
way BC. There was no technology. There was no forklifts. There was no way of lifting these things. So for them to be built with that minimal of an error rate is like godlike. Mm -hmm. Out of this world. Out of this world. <laughs> History books say that the slaves built the pyramids, but they didn't have slaves at this time. Okay, I see that's one of your fun facts. I don't really understand that one. Well, because I saw this thing where, like, I remember being taught where slaves built the pyramids, but yeah, I that too. they didn't even have slaves until, like, around Cleopatra's time, which was, like, way into the New Kingdom. So, like, the fact that history was that far off, like, what are they trying to teach us? What are they trying to hide? That's yeah. where, like, my little fun fact came from. Well, they aligned the pyramids to true north in Orion's belt without a compass because they somehow had lots of knowledge of the stars. Now, when I was researching this, it was so cool because it kind of tied into astrology. Mm -hmm. And you're a Pisces, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Great Pyramids were created, the center top of the pyramid that points to the true north, that true north sign, which I'm still kind of stupid when it comes to astrology, but I'm hoping I'm saying this right, was in Pisces at the time. Yeah. And so that was like really, really cool. And um, right now it's in. Is it Aquarius? It's about to go into Aquarius. I think it is. That's a big conspiracy right now because there's like the age of blank, like the age of Pisces, the age of Aquarius. We just got out of the age of Pisces, so I guess like the ages overlap since then. But people think that the age of Aquarius started kind of like in 2020. Some people believe that it's just starting now. So back to our fun facts. The stones used weren't native, so they were hauled a great distance. And I actually read that they were hauled on average about 500 miles. Cool. And these stones weighed like, I want to say like two tons? No, two they, thousand pounds or something? I have it on here somewhere if I can figure out where it was. Some of the heaviest ones, which were like these giant granite beams, they weighed over 70 tons, which is about equivalent to 35 large SUVs. And these things were hauled across the desert for 500 miles. And keep in mind, the wheel wasn't even invented at this point. They were, what, dragging it? That's what I'm saying. And then there's actually this other thing that we were talking about. So in the Great Pyramid, there's something called the King's Chamber, which is kind of like towards the top of the pyramid. And it's roofed and floored with those granite beams, which are the heaviest parts of the pyramid. And those weighed those 70 tons. Well. The beams literally like supported the roof and the floors for the pyramid. And the way they angled these 70 ton beams, people are like, how did they lift it and get it brought all the way up to the top to be able to angle it that way? So in order for us physically to be able to move these beams, we would, if we wanted to like push it, they say, okay, they probably made a ramp or something and slid it up the ramp. That's what Egyptologists are saying right now. But the slope, to push something that heavy, the slope of that ramp has to be 10 degrees. If it was any more than 10 degrees, we physically could not push something that heavy up the ramp. But if it was a slope of 10 degrees, that ramp would extend for almost over a mile out of the pyramid. And there's no way they built a ramp like that. We would see it. Yeah. And also, when I think of like the people that, okay, if it was people that built this, I, I tend to think of like people today, like being like around our age, healthy and strong. But the people of ancient Egypt, they lived to about 30 years old and died because their health was like so poor and most of that came from their parents were like incest and stuff. And yeah. it was generations and generations of incest. And so it like deformed these people, they had diseases. So like these aren't the strongest people out there. I'm sure they had strong people, but not that many. So, for a, civiliz <laughs> for a civilization that documented everything, there is no clear, concise information on why the pyramids came to be. We can, like, make guesses based off of things that we find in writings in the pyramid, but there's nothing that says, like, we built these three pyramids to commemorate blah, 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 blah. Or yeah, to atone for blah, blah, blah. Nothing on how they did it either. Exactly. And this is one that me and Marina actually just realized, and it kind of hurts me because it's, like, not even really a pyramid. But pyramids actually have eight sides and not four sides. So for those of us that are watching on YouTube, y'all can be able to like kind of see a visual here. The base of the pyramid is like a square. Well, the base of these pyramids are kind of concaved in like this, to where there's actually eight sides rather than four. Yeah, you can only see it from a bird's eye view. So that, that kind of like shocked me. 
You're gonna have to read the last one. <laughs> okay. And just to put into perspective, just how long ago this was, woolly mammoths still roamed the earth when the pyramids were being built. And I just thought that was so mind blowing. Cause like you think of a woolly mammoth and you think of like the ice age and then boom, the Egyptians came like, what? We I need to do an episode on the ice age too. Yes. I, oh, how like the earth came to be and I, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> like how many civilizations were around before the civilizations we have now? Yeah. And like, see, I'm sorry, what were we saying? Like the oldest one that I can think of is like the Sumerians. Yeah. Like, I wonder, I just love history. <laughs> so the thing with these pyramids, whether you believe it or not, there, or biblically or not, there was a flood that happened with the earth. Geologists all say the earth was flooded at one period of time. Whether you believe that was Noah's Ark story or not, there was a flood. They, and there was some type of cataclysm or event that wiped out all of humanity. Some people say that was like the meteor that came and killed the dinosaurs. Something happened that kind of reset life on Earth. These pyramids were here before life was reset on Earth, which is kind of crazy because they were built by a civilization that we probably don't know a lot about and we don't know their use for. And whereas when most things were destroyed on Earth, those pyramids still stood till today. So why those pyramids specifically survived these traumatic cataclysms and events is kind of crazy. Yeah. And also, they somehow had lighting in the tunnels of the pyramids, I saw. And, like, it's not fire or anything because once you get deep into the tunnels, there's, like, no oxygen flow, really. Or, like, it would, or maybe there, I don't know. But something about, like, being deep in the pyramids like that, a fire would go out. Yeah. So, like, how did they light it? Because it's like all a bunch of tunnels, like get up into the pyramid, like they're not doing that in pitch black. No. And then like all the art that they painted on the walls, they needed light for that. So like how? Now, there's a guy um, who I was listening to a lot of his videos from. His name's Graham Hancock, and he is an expert on ancient civilizations, but he really has been focusing in on the civilizations built around the pyramids. That just fascinates him. And he believes that we are looking too much into the physical realm of science, what we can see and what we understand based off of observations we make. He believes that these other civilizations, they looked at things, and I don't really want to use the word spiritual, but in a way that they were able to perceive things that we can't even perceive right now because we've shut ourselves off to that for so long. Mm -hmm. And that's how he believes that, and whether you want to believe that it is like some form of magic, which the Egyptians were all about spiritualism and like magical practices and gods and goddesses. They had their crystals. They had their crystals. Do you want to believe like that? Or if you want to believe, which I know Marina believes, I don't even asking her, it was aliens that did it. Um, something had to have done. There is no way here that it's people. Y'all know no, I am a skeptic, but there is no way people built these pyramids. Not by themselves, at least. Like, I get left so speechless after hearing some of these things. Because it's just like, damn, that happened on our Earth and we can't explain it. There's so much we can't explain. It. There's so much about our world that we just don't know, and that is so crazy to me. I know. So, let's talk about the Great Pyramid in specific, because I think that's the one that has the most mystery surrounding it. There's three pyramids in the road. The Great Pyramid is the biggest of them all, and the Sphinx is just a little ways away from them. But isn't the Great one like the Pyramid of Giza? Yes. Okay. Um. So the Great one, it weighs six million tons. So that's what six million times two thousand pounds. That's a ton. I don't even feel like doing that in my head right now. But. It was built up using 2.3 million stones. Each one was cut with laser precision. We were talking about that 0.03% error rate. That's including the size difference between each of the stones that were put, were cut so perfectly and precisely. So how were they making cuts like that? It probably couldn't have been done by hand. I refuse to believe that people cutting stone with, first of all, how are you cutting stone back then? But we hadn't even hit the Iron Age yet, so there's no swords, no kind of knives, none of that. And we also weren't like smelting things, so it's not like they were like melting sides of it all. So how are we doing it? I have no idea. But they cut those stones, and like we said before, transported them for over 500 miles. 
Now, I want to do an entire episode of Nikola Tesla. I'm just going to mention him briefly here because he was obsessed with the Great Pyramids. He thought that we could get endless energy and power off of these pyramids. Now, if you don't know a lot about Nikola Tesla, he um, was one of the greatest inventors of our time. He's responsible for inventions of things like cars and a bunch of really cool phenomena that we have today. Um, over, he is directly responsible for over 80% of the technology we experience today. I didn't know that until I heard that fact today, and I thought that was super cool. And then he mysteriously died in his hotel room at 85 years old. Another just guy dying. Well, Tesla was obsessed with this idea of 3, 6, and 9. And this is something that we see a lot in the pyramids, and I'm about to explain that. But he said that the key to understanding everything in this world was the numbers 3, 6, and 9. And he believed this so much so that he would always do things in numbers 3, 6, and 9. So he would wipe his mouth with th like three napkins. Or he would go ahead and only stay in hotel rooms that were divisible by three. Or he would, before he parked somewhere, he would drive around the like store nine times and then park. He believed it so much so that he, d he thought that was the secret to the universe. Well, when these um, Egyptologists started to examine the Great Pyramid, the way that the pyramid has eight sides, it kind of dissects the pyramid into a bunch of different angles. I know it's hard to picture this. Hopefully I can post on the Instagram a picture that kind of explains what I'm trying to say. But when they measured all of these angles, every single angle, and there's hundreds of them, all added up to either three, six, or nine. And this is something that Tesla could not of any way have known. The error rate of that entire pyramid is 0.03%. Three, and is another one of those numbers. So they think that even that error rate that is so slim was purposeful. Which yeah. is, it's like blowing my mind just talking about it right now, how crazy that was. So I wanted to give Tesla some mention. Oh, and this is also one of the craziest things ever. So with the shape of the Great Pyramid, they could, if you shrunk the Earth down to skies, if you shrunk it down 420,000 times, you could fit the earth perfectly, snugly, exactly, not even a millimeter off inside of the Great Pyramid. And it would be touching the walls just perfectly. Because it was made to scale to fit a smaller version of the earth into it. For what? Exactly. <laughs> now, the, he believes that with the earth rotating on two magnetic poles, and it, he thinks that the earth is basically like an electromagnetic machine. So, let's take the earth. I want everybody to just picture the Earth right now, and picture you're cutting the Earth in half along the equator. Alright, so we have the Earth cut in half along the equator. If you move up one-third of the way towards the North Pole, once again, we have one-third, three, it's one of those magical numbers, that is exactly down to the exact degree where the center of the Great Pyramid sits. And he believed that, that those pyramids were like conductors that could use the magnetic energy of the Earth to create unlimited power. Dude, okay, okay. I have two things to say. <laughs> First of all, all that keeps playing in my head is that Get Low song, 369. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I bet you would have loved that song. <laughs> like, it's got so many conspiracies going on in my mind. Like, what was, who sings that? Ludacris? I don't know. I, Probably, I like, think so. Lil John. I think it's That is song. who it is. But, like, is he in its own conspiracy that I don't know about? But, anyways, also, this whole back to the pyramid, like, having forces or whatever. I saw something where, like, a lot of people believe the Great Pyramid is a time machine, some kind of way, and, like, I wish I would have researched more into that. But and that patent was actually his model of a generator to create that unlimited power based off of where everything was in um, reference to the equator. And it was in the shape of a pyramid. We have the drawing of his generator that he was building in the shape of a pyramid. And he died before it could ever come out. So we'll never get to see what it actually was. But that is kind of crazy to me. Everything is freaking crazy. Okay. Does that cover, like, all of our pyramid stuff? There is so much more in different theories about the pyramids. But as far as, like... I don't know, some of the science-y stuff behind it. There's a mytholo mythological side of it, too, which we can talk about, but... Oh, we want to get into King Tut? Let's get into King Tut. Oh, my God. Okay. So, do you, do you have my PowerPoint pictures up? Mm-hmm. Because, like, King Tut... 
growing up, I like was in love with him just because he was an Egyptian god, basically. Well, a king, a pharaoh. But recent science has like painted this picture of what he looks like. <laughs> And he is so ugly, y'all. So ugly. Okay, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But little is actually known about King Tut's life. He became king around, which I don't even want to say the year because I've seen different years in like almost every article that I've read. But it was around like 1000 BC. And he became king at the age, or between the ages of 8 and 10. And he ruled until his death at 19 years old. Like I said, these people did not live long, but basically, a little bit of his history was his father, King Akhenaten, Akhenaten, that sounds Egyptian, okay. His father had instituted several religious reforms based, okay, so like before King Tut, they all believed in like multiple gods and goddesses and stuff, but when his dad became king, he said, nope, we're only going to worship Ra, which is like the god of life or it's the god of the sun but they god. also he was like the rome version of zeus he was like yeah. the almighty one yeah so he was like jesus basically um so and a lot of egyptians didn't really want to do that but they're like i guess we gotta listen to our pharaoh but then when his father died and he became king he skirt skirted back and he was like we can worship multiple gods but it's believed that he still had enemies because of what his father did and they think he was murdered because at first people believed because when that when his mummy was found his leg was messed up and they thought that he died from like a leg fracture and a chariot accident or something but as we're learning more about his life it's more believed that he was murdered um and then he was hidden, and we didn't know anything about him until we accidentally found his tomb because his enemies erased his name from history. So there, he's not really in, like, the hieroglyphs a lot. But once we found his tomb, we were able to discover so much about him. Um, and he was found in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, which is the coolest concept to me, that they have a Valley of the Kings, like... If you've seen, like, a video or picture of it, like, just walking along this little sand road and there's, like, little staircases that go off into the ground and there's just treasure all up in them. Which, most of these have been looted. Screw y'all looters, but y'all are all dead now anyways. <laughs> um, so, when they went into his tomb, it was virtually intact. Like, it looked like it had maybe been open and shut, like, once or twice. But like most of the stuff was still in there. It was a little rummaged, but it was like mostly intact. And they found his famous gold mask that they put on top of or over his head. And they found the statues of him, jewelry, chariots, toys, perfumes, 130 canes that are all like really, really bougie because he had a clubbed foot, turns out. Like his foot was F up. And they believe it was because of his incest parents and it wasn't just his parents that were incest because things like this deformity takes generations to form um and they also found two little coffins which are believed to be his stillborn daughters which i didn't know king Tut had any i think i remember hearing about that kids but i mean i guess he didn't have kids but stillborn daughters count <laughs> he did have two daughters so um, oh yeah, it was only in 2006 that they discovered all of this about King Tut's body, and it actually still resides in the Valley of the Kings, but, okay, so this is where we get into the curse of the pharaohs, because Egyptians believed in the afterlife as like the most holy thing. The reason yes. why they had all these treasures and these big, big tombs was because they believed in burying their royal people with everything they would ever need in the afterlife. Like, they even had food up in there and all their animals. So, the curse of the pharaohs is alleged to be cast upon anyone who disturbs the mummy of an ancient Egyptian, especially a pharaoh. And this is, like, explicitly 
put in the hieroglyphics like of the entrances of the tombs like do not disturb or you will be cursed but this curse doesn't like differentiate between thieves or archaeologists or anyone that visits the tomb so like anyone that goes near it is susceptible to be cursed basically and well these are just some of the things that happen to people that came into contact with especially King Tut's tomb and other Egyptian things so there was a trumpet found in Tut's tomb and every time it was played in history a war happened after so it first started with this British guy that played it and then World War II happened. And then it was played again and the Six Day War between Egypt and Israel happened. And then it happened at the beginning of the Gulf War. And then the last time it was ever played was 2011 right before the Egyptian Rebellion. Guys, I want y'all to listen to me. I want y'all to listen to me closely. If one of y'all blow that damn trumpet right now, we are already dealing with enough in 2021. Do not blow that trumpet yeah, this year. Yeah, someone snuck it in 2020. <laughs> they literally <laughs> blow it. <laughs> so, uh, okay. When, oh wait, but you know what? In 2020, King Tut was removed from his resting place for some kind of scientific purpose or like a tour of Tut type of thing they do. But they, he was moved out of his tomb and they think that was like the 2020 curse. <laughs> I 100% think that's probably why 2020 is the way it was. But can we also talk about how weird it feels that they just like ship King Tut's body around the place like on tour? Like he is a mummy, he is fragile. I can literally remember it coming to Louisiana one time, like the entire King Tut exhibit, like with his body, like, and I'm pretty yeah. sure I went actually. I'm gonna have to ask my parents. I'd be it was a too long scared to go knowing what I know now. <laughs> like back then, I would have totally loved to see it, but if I would have known about the curse, I wouldn't. But okay, so then the archaeologist that actually found his tomb, his name is Howard Carter, and he, when he found the tomb, he unleashed this like love and wander about Egypt that turned dark pretty fast and so people would visit it more more archaeologists visited and so on and so forth so there was this guy Lord Carnivon who was like one of the sponsors that funded the excavation of his tomb and then he was bit by a mosquito on the cheek and then he cut it open when he was shaving and it de he developed a blood poisoning and died a few weeks later. And at the very moment that he died, Egypt's entire power grid went out. Like that moment. And not long after, his dog back in London let out this blood curdling yelp and died. Like, that's weird. Hey, why does this kind of remind me of when we, what was it, like episode three, we did Demon House, everybody left the house just like dying in weird ways? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's sus. And then three years after discovering Tut's tomb, 11 people that were involved died, and six of the 26 people that witnessed the opening of the tomb were dead within 10 years, and by 1935, 21 people connected to the tomb were dead. And we're talking between 20 years, so like, yeah, it's natural for a lot of people to die, but the ways that they die are weird. Include, oh wait, so some hieroglyphs that were found on the tomb, like, were translated to, they who enter this sacred tomb shall swift be visited by wings of death. I will kill all of those who cross this threshold into the sacred precincts of the royal king who lives forever. Um, Okay, so then there was an Egyptian prince that visited the tomb in 1923 and was soon after murdered by his wife. And then there was a member of the excavation team that literally got so tired of watching his colleagues die in these mysterious ways and he believed it was because of the curse. He wrote a suicide letter in his own blood and then hung himself. So like, it was real enough for a person to take their life over just witnessing like his friends die over this curse and then the man that x-rayed king tut's body when it was first found and able to be x-rayed was deathly ill the very next day and died three days later and then someone gave like someone that was a part of the operation 
gave a mummified hand as a paperweight to a friend, and it had a bracelet on it that translated to something like, curse be he that moves my body. And that guy's house burned down, and then while rebuilding his house, it was flooded. I have so many questions. Wait, he gave him a hand, mm -hmm. a, a actual hand that was mummified? Yeah, as a paperweight. Who, like, here's who would decor. do that? And then, did he not realize that the, what the bracelet said? No, I guess not. I hate it. They deserved to die. Well, I guess they didn't die, but his house deserved to be burnt down. Well, that was guy was kind house. of innocent. Yeah, he didn't that. know what the hell was going on. <laughs> but then, there was another guy's house that did catch on fire that worked with the team. And he went back into the burning house to get a, his manuscript called The Egyptian Book of the Dead. It died trying to get that book in the burning house. Kind of reminds me of the Egyptian Book of the Dead or the Book of Thoth, which we'll talk about in episode two. Yeah. Oh, man. So the, the Pharaoh's curses could very well be very, very real. And the fact that they did move his body in 2020, who knows, man? Who knows? Did you see anything about if stuff like that ever happens whenever they do with other pharaohs, or is it like very specific to King Tut? It's almost very specific to King Tut, but a lot of the other pharaohs' tombs, like, have we even really found most of them in, as intact as we found King Tut's? Because, like, you don't, you only ever hear about his because his was, like, the most preserved. Yeah. All the other people that like found the other tombs of the pharaohs, I guess their curse expired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, Would you like to renew your pharaoh's curse? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I do have some more interesting little tidbits about some things that were found with King Tut. So he was one of the things he had was this dagger. And it had a gold handle, and it was made of iron, which was very, very rare. Because the Iron Age hadn't happened yet, and they found the phrase in hieroglyphics saying that it was from above. Um, and this makes sense because after, like, scientific analysis was done on this dagger, it concluded that it was made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, which is what meteorites are composed of. And I saw something where it's believed that a meteorite hit the desert near Egypt and turned the sand into glass. And they mm. were able to like wield these mysterious substances that we can't explain because it did come from outer space. And there was also this beetle brooch and they did an oxygen isotope analysis that said it was made of glass and it came from that like sand that turned to glass and the only way to make glass like this is from a very high temperature which a meteorite would easily get. So I just thought that was very cool. Oh, and they believe that this meteorite that hit Egypt was 10,000 times more powerful than an atomic bomb. Yeah, and I think the pyramids were already built at that point so like you said these pyramids literally survived everything yeah because like if a meteorite that was that big hit like texas we'd be obliterated and that's what that guy graham hancock was saying he thinks that the pyramids are some type of sign or reminder to us so that the secrets and the code of the universe will always be here with for us throughout no matter what happens they'll always stand which and we just haven't discovered it yet Now, I also saw another guy, and I thought this was kind of cool, who he thinks that the pyramids were built by whether it's actually the god Osiris or his followers or people that just believed in the god Osiris, but for like a temple for his reincarnation. Are you familiar with the story of Osiris and Set? I just know they're like gods, right? Yeah, I'm not going to go into detail on the story because it doesn't really matter, but Osiris is like the god of the afterlife and the god of death and then there was his nemesis set who ended up killing him and then tore his body into a bunch of pieces and just got rid of him. Um, 
And then there was another goddess named Isis who was wanted to bring Osiris back. She was in love with Osiris. And there's all kinds of sacred texts that talk about um, Isis going into the secret chamber in order to revive uh, Osiris and bring him back from the dead. Well, when you really look into that text, the dimensions and the way that the chambers of the room she's in when she's bringing him back are described are exactly like the inside of the Great Pyramid. So some people believe that it's referencing the exact same thing, and they think that maybe that that pyramid was built to bring a god back to life. So whether you believe that's true or not, it is pretty interesting, and there are some uh, experts out there that believe that was the case. I mean, if Jesus could be put into a cave and come back to life, I'm sure a pharaoh could, or a god, or whatever. Whew. Also, did you know that until 1996, two of Egypt's greatest cities were missing? They kept seeing them pop up in hieroglyphs and like they were trying to piece together the history and everything. And for a thousand years, there was this place called Donis Hirakleon. And that was the city that they were trying to figure out what the heck happened to it. Well, turns out it was completely underwater now. And fish had made their homes in the temples that were underground, hieroglyphs were covered in algae. Like, they have pictures of these scuba divers underwater with these, like, big Egyptian statues. Like, it was a whole city underwater. Like, Atlantis? But not. Yeah. Whew. And, like, it just, it's so eerie. Because they just, it just sat there underwater waiting to be discovered and it, which brings me to the fact that, like, we're still discovering so much about Egypt currently. There's this girl, and they found 3,000 ancient settlements buried under the African sands. And this includes 17 previously undiscovered pyramids. And according to Sarah, Miss Dr. Sarah, only one one hundredth of one percent of archaeological sites in Egypt have been discovered. That's like so cool to think about. I know, like think about how much stuff we want to talk about right now and we feel overwhelmed, but there's still like a billion more things to learn. <sighs> it's overwhelming, like I don't want to die before we know everything about Egypt. I mean, there's we're like looking so much into like different planets and like the stars, but there's so much about our own Earth that we don't even understand yet. I know. She's been here for billions of years. She's gone through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and y'all are putting her through more, so y'all need to start taking care of the environment. Yeah, don't ask for a plastic bag when you have one item. <laughs> that, <laughs> Man, the rage. <laughs> that makes me so mad at Best Buy. Like, someone will be buying, like, a pack of two batteries and want a whole bag for it. I'm like, okay, whatever. Kill the planet. I don't care anymore. Um, another really cool thing about Egypt and the Egyptians, they were obsessed with the stars in the sky. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely obsessed. They followed stars, they were huge into astrology, and they, they truthfully, wholeheartedly believed all of that. Mm -hmm. Which, even like in the Bible, like, Israel and stuff, I'm not going to say it's similar, I know that's like, not true to Egypt, but there are very many similarities, and they do coincide a lot throughout the Bible. But... Even in the Bible, they were obsessed with the sky. They followed the star of David to find Jesus. Like The pussy star. Exactly. So, I don't know. It's pretty cool. And also, like, they knew about planets that hadn't been discovered yet. Like, they referenced Pluto a lot. And, like, Pluto isn't even a planet anymore. But how the heck did they know? Well, unless they had aliens coming to tell them, hey, guys, guess what's out there? So let's wrap this episode up and we'll save the rest of the next episode. We're running out of time with what do you think is the most likely explanation for how these pyramids got here and mm -hmm. all this ancient civilization that we have? Yeah, tell us your theories because I'd love to hear them. I'm asking you specifically. What is your theory? How do you think it's here? <laughs> oh, aliens, duh. You think it's all aliens? <sighs> I, I think so. I really do, because like, 
I wish I was able to watch Stephen Greer's documentary again because he referenced some aliens in his, or he referenced Egypt in his alien documentary. That made me like mind blown. And I tried to find it just by Googling it, but like Stephen Greer's information is like so like hidden and censored like you have to like buy the documentary to watch it and get the info because you can't yeah. just find an article about what's a Stephen Greer thing so that's unfortunate but I believe it is 80% aliens and a lot of things that they consider gods I remember watching this I don't know if you've ever seen the show is it called ancient aliens is that yeah, what it's called I, I think so I, I remember seeing this from like years ago when they said that what if they believe that all the gods like the sun god Ra and stuff was just like 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 spaceships, like the fire coming out of ships and stuff like that. So made him think it was the sun god, things along those lines. Like Yeah, and they say that a lot of like the UFO found in Roswell was said to have hieroglyphics on it. And the things that like the technology and the progression that they were taught are things that so like, for example, we're gonna talk about him next episode, but Thoth is like the god of writing and knowledge. He was the one that apparently taught the Egyptians hieroglyphics and how to write. So, like, what if that was, like, some type of alien species or something that was already further along that taught them things like that? Like, I don't know, it's pretty yeah. cool. And they don't have to necessarily be, like, these green aliens that we want to picture because there's literally, like, been authorities come out within the last few months that say the Nordic species of aliens are, like, literally roaming Earth right now as we speak and they appear as, like, blonde humans that you can't differentiate. Yeah. So, like, it wouldn't surprise me that they were human-like aliens roaming the Earth, building these ancient civilizations. Like, it could have, like, the whole community of Egypt could have just, like, parked here from space, made this civilization, helped it flourish, and then was like, okay, humans, take over. <laughs> we guided y'all. We did our job. My only question to then would be, like, okay, then why have they just not showing themselves again in so long maybe because see this is when like the bible starts to play in my brain because like the whole adam and eve thing like what if while okay this is a wild wild theory and me just thinking out of my ass right now <laughs> but what if like the aliens came to earth and then like the first humans were there at the same time and it was adam and eve and then like she bit into the apple or whatever and the aliens were like they're not worthy and they dipped out and they were like humans need to realize what life is about before we come back and like help them which brings me to like the age of aquarius and like the third eyes opening people are becoming more aware and questioning things and the whole discussion about aliens being like working with the government is starting to come out more and like official documents and they've said that like they don't want to disrupt human life because we have to figure things out for our own but like they're here to help along the way so i don't know i don't know we live in a crazy world with just so many questions i could talk about this forever oh no all right y'all that's about all the time we have for episode one but make sure y'all come back for episode two, and we will go deeper into some theories. We're going to talk about mummification, which was crazy advanced for the time. And also we're going to talk a little bit more about the Egyptian gods and some of the relics that they left behind that people are still searching for in these tombs today. Yeah. All right, make sure you go ahead and give us a follow at Southern Book Podcast on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or you can follow me at Kaylin Ricardo. And me at Ren Marina Renee. Also, please, 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 please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yes. <laughs> I just looked right in the camera. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Please subscribe. Because, I don't know, we only have like 20 subscribers right now. And I just want to put the word out there that we exist and we're here to like have fun conversations with you guys. Absolutely, y'all. And until next time, stay woke. Yep.